Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm Liz Fuller from the Southport Historical Society, and today we have, I really thank you for coming to our new quarterly program um, with Desi, who is also from the Southport Historical Society. She's one of our board members, and she knows a lot about a lot of really interesting different things. And so uh, she's going to be talking to us today about plant lore and history and folklore, and especially focused on the spring. And the plan is to do this quarterly. Um, for each of the seasons. So um, Desi, when every, and I think she's, you're gonna be speaking without slides today. So if you wanna put it on speaker view, um, you'll get a nice view of Desi and her <laughs> <laughs> and, um And then we'll have a few slides toward the end. So um, take it away, Desi. All right. All right, thank you for joining me today. Um, as Liz has mentioned, we're going to be doing four different seasons, or the four seasons, I should say. And give me one second. I am so sorry. My phone, or my laptop did something strange. There we go. Okay. Sorry. All right. I'm back. So I am going to be talking about the four seasons and plant lore and being March and the spring equinox coming up on the 21st, I'm starting with spring. Now spring, when does it start? It depends on the time period. If you ask folks today, it also will depend on if they live further north, further south. We, here in the south, we are seeing spring a little earlier. Um, anyone that I know that's from up north says they really, they don't care what date you give them, spring is April for them, especially around Easter time. If you go back through history and you look at agrarian societies, it's going to fluctuate too, but typically May is going to be May Day is your first day of spring going into April itself. Um, for all intents and purposes, we're going to focus, though, on the equinoxes and the solstices as I progress uh, through the series itself. So I'm going to say spring is going to start on the 21st, whether it feels like it or not. Here in North Carolina, especially down in Southport, we're starting to see the beginnings of spring. So that's how we're going to kind of focus. Now, spring itself, a lot of people think the minute it happens, there was abundance. Hollywood movies are, are really good at kind of making people believe that spring was a great time of the year. And it is once you get into spring proper. But the end of winter and early spring were your leanest times of the year for most people. They're starting to go through what they may have stockpiled up for the winter time. And there's not a lot coming in from your gardens this time of the year. Um, if you stockpiled properly and if you plant it properly, this lean time isn't going to be that long, but there could be blights uh, throughout the year that may have either stopped you from being able to preserve enough in the fall and winter to get you through these lean times, or there could be a blight at the beginning of spring that's gonna set you back a couple weeks. You're not going to be seeing too much butchering of animals this time of the year. You want them to create babies, so you're kind of leaving them alone. But the good news is your hens, especially if you had the breed that aren't going to be lying in the wintertime eggs because they need that sunlight, they're starting to lay those eggs again in February because I think you've all noticed about mid-February on the days are starting to get longer. And that is the set of spring. You're starting to see more sunlight. So that is going to not only cause your hens to lay more eggs, you may have noticed the birds are starting to sing a little more in the mornings and evening. And some of the plants are starting to appear that you can rely on to get you through those lean times. Now for the four part series, I'm not really talking about the folks living in urban centers. I'm fixating mainly on your rural settings. So it's going to be the countryside going into the forest. That's where you're going to be getting your forged goods. 
With that, one of the plants that you're going to see arriving first, and I've talked about it before, and I promise you, I'm going to talk about it pretty heavily right now in spring. And even though I love this plant, it's not going to pop up again the next three seasons. And that is the dandelion. Um, that poor, humble little weed is a pretty important plant this time of the year, not just for humans, but for your pollinators. It's one of the first flowers to come up that your hibernating sleeping little honeybees and other pollinators are gonna be able to get nectar from. And even though we may look at this little flower and think it's noxious and ugly, it's actually really, really good for you. And it's really tasty. If, while I'm talking, I should you know say this real quick with foraging. Please, before you go foraging out in your yard, out in nature, make sure you know what you're picking. So maybe go with an expert. Don't just rely on photos because there's too many plants that are toxic that look like non-toxic plants. Also, I'm gonna say this right now, just because that dandelion's growing in your front yard and you may not use pesticides and herbicides and such like that, it's still out in nature and it may not be covered, which means a critter might have passed by. So if you harvest, please wash properly. Or if you really want to experiment with dandelions and some of the other plants that I will be talking about, maybe put them in their own pots in a protected covered area. That way you can kind of harvest as well and not really worry about what may have passed by uh, during the night or during the day, what may have flew over. So back to the dandelion. The only part of this plant when you're foraging you're not going to be interested in is the green bits right here. And it's really bitter. It's not going to hurt you. It's just going to ruin the flavor. If you're harvesting your dandelion flower, which you would be during this time of the year to make dandelion wine, you're going to just want this pretty little piece up here. Now, the reason you're making dandelion wine is it's not only a, a tasty wine, but it would have been used historically as a cordial. And a cordial, think of it as the cough syrups or cough syrups before our time. You will see people taking cordials for a wide range of ailments. It could be they have seasonal allergies, um, bronchitis. It could even be for aches and pains. And a cordial could be either taken alone, mixed in with vinegar and water, or in a glass of wine or sometimes even beer. To make your cordials and wines, you had multiple recipes during this time period that you could pull from. And if you were able to read, it could be from cookbooks that were available throughout time, like the Virginia Housewife or Backcountry Housewife. More likely though, these are gonna be recipes that are passed down through your family. And you would have seen your grandmother, aunt, or even your mother making, and you would have carried on that tradition within your family. The other part of the plant that people are going to be very interested in this time of the year are the fresh green leaves that are coming up from the center. Now, you can eat dandelion later on in the season, but it tends to get pretty tough and bitter. So springtime is really when you see folks going out and harvesting this green. It has a lot of antioxidants in it, it has beta carotene in it. It was supposed to also help with blood sugar, blood pressure, but really it's considered a diuretic. And in the spring, you want to purge. Um, it is a time to basically flush the system. In Italy and in parts of Austria and Germany, there is often folk recipes or traditional medicine where you will see people going out in the springtime and harvesting the plant and eating that salad, either raw with maybe a, a light vinaigrette dressing on top, or they may steam it or stew it and eat it that way. But they're going to eat as much dandelion as possible to flush their system because they believe that being inside, not being out as much, uh, especially in a modern sense today, we tend to eat a little heavy around the holidays. It's believed that by eating this dandelion, you're flushing out all the bad and you're ready to start into the next season. So think of your dandelion as your spring cleaning plant for your body. <laughs> I highly recommend if you can get your hands 
on the, the leaves themselves and you're, you're sure they're clean and safe to use, to go ahead and mix them in with your mixed green salads. Uh, they are really quite delightful. I think they have a bit of a, a peppery taste to them. Another part, and I didn't dig up my dandelions outside, so I'm afraid I don't have the root to show you, but another part you'll be using is the root. And we have a recipe later on that I will go over with you. And that is for making dandelion tea from the roots or dandelion coffee. Throughout history, coffee beans weren't as readily available as they are today. So by actually roasting and using the root itself, you're gonna get a pretty strong flavored liquid. Think of like your really, really dark teas. And this would often be drank in place of coffee beans. If you A, couldn't get your hand on coffee and you just wanted a, a darker beverage or two, you maybe only are drinking coffee on the holiday special events, Sundays, and during the rest of the week, the dandelion root could have been what you're using. Um, some of you may be familiar with chicory root. It's kind of in the, the same family and how it would have been used throughout its time. Now, as far as folklore, mainly the folklore around dandelion is the fact that it's a good uh, plant to basically purge the system. It's not really used all that often in the household as far as I've seen for cleaning and such like that. It seems to just be a plant that's digested and that was its purpose. It is not native, the type that I'm talking about to America. This was actually a potting and garden herb that was brought over to Europe and it just naturalized out into our landscaping. Think of uh, your snowdrop, another non-native that's kind of taken off. Uh, that said, one of the reasons I will not be discussing snowdrop is that it is toxic. So please leave that in the ground or if you pick it, just put it in a bud vase. But um, do not nibble on the snowdrop. In fact, a lot of your early crocuses and such like that, outside of your crocus where you will be getting saffron from, um, I would really just leave them in the garden and, and enjoy them and let the bees and other critters have fun with those. And before I leave dandelion, I just want to say one more thing. It's good to have dandelion, I think, in your yard. Yes, it ruins a perfectly green lawn. It doesn't look as manicured as you'd like. My experience, though, is I've never had a problem from animals such as bunnies eating any of the other plants that I've put out in my yard because they love dandelion. They also like wild leeks and onions and We'll get into that a little later in this talk. So if you see them springing up in your yard, just let them be. Even maybe have a patch of your yard you let go natural. That's becoming quite a trend right now, letting your grass kind of go to seed in certain areas. Again, it may not look good. I'm not saying do your whole yard because you don't really want to create a habitat for certain pests like uh, ticks and mice and such. But if you have select sections, maybe away from your home and away from your garden, you're gonna find a lot of nature is gonna prefer those areas and wanna hang out there instead of coming closer to your house or to the garden patches you have. Or maybe they just don't wanna eat my stuff and they don't like me, it's, it's hard to say. <laughs> All right, so we're gonna be passing away from the humble little dandelion and we are moving on next to fiddlehead ferns. Now that is another plant you're gonna see early on in spring. Fiddlehead ferns, I do recommend right now, do not go out into your garden if you have ferns or if you have one in your house and start picking the fiddleheads and eating them. It's certain breeds that are edible and that is going to be your bracken, um, your lady fern, your ostrich fern, it's, it's a hit or miss. That one can have enough toxins in it that it may cause digestive issues. So I recommend going to a farmer's market, a grocery store, anywhere where you, and you can see this sometimes appearing, fiddlehead ferns coming from a uh, viable seller, purchase it from them. And it's gonna be this time of the year into May that you're gonna see them appearing. Um, once you steam and cook them, they're quite delightful, especially if you mix them with asparagus and eggs. And that typically is the recipes that you see of this time period. Again, you're getting eggs, from your hens, so that's going to be a reliable protein source available. Um, asparagus can come up relatively early if you're in warm enough climates. If not, 
you can see them using it with some other greens I'm going to be mentioning later on and basically having your greens and your protein at the same time. Ferns have a very long history in, in folklore and tradition, especially if you go over to uh, England. One thing is it's believed to be a plant that um, is popular in fairy lore. Uh, if you've ever heard of Puck, most of us will think of Puck maybe from Shakespeare, but it was considered a plant that he was particularly interested in. So you had to be very careful when harvesting because you could fall into fairyland or lose your way. <laughs> um, it was recommended sometimes that you pick it only on a full moon of this date or if you did pick it, you had to make sure that you did not step on a single fern branch the whole time you were in there. They also believed, and I pulled from one of my ferns in the yard, I hope you'll be able to see it, all those little dots underneath, we'll just call them fern seeds. But basically they believe that if you ingested these little seeds, please don't try this at home, it would cause invisibility. And sometimes you will read in folklore, um, maybe fairy tales that a character is ingesting uh, fern seeds. They also, if you go back to Greco-Roman times, thought if you ingested fern seeds that it would help from becoming intoxicated. It's not gonna work. Um, it's the same as they thought if you were amethyst, um, you were never gonna become intoxicated. It's my birthstone. Um, I wear amethyst. I'm not saying I get intoxicated regularly, but I can tell you it does not work. Um, <laughs> you're gonna feel the effects. It has, ferns are, are, are just such a wonderful romantic looking plant. It's even worked its way into modern literature. Uh, for instance, Tolkien mentions it quite a few times in his various stories. Uh, the Ring Cycle, Lord of the Rings. Uh, he actually mentions that Frodo slept on a bed of ferns and uh, grass after he had met with the elves in the Shire. So. If you have it in your garden, do appreciate it. If not for the fiddlehead ferns that you're going to be eating, but just for the fact that it is one of those plants that just pops up again and again and again in folklore. Um, there's not too much more to say on it. It does have potassium and iron and vitamin B. I myself have not really seen it being made in too many different tinctures and tonics. Uh, like you would with the dandelion. So fern typically was seen as a early plant to have, to cook up and to eat, and you knew it was beneficial to your health. Of course, historically, they're not exactly sure how it's affecting the body, but they just knew they felt better after they were eating it. And there was something within the fern itself that their body obviously was lacking and they needed to get back into their system. So we're going to leave ferns and we're going to go on to the next plant that I'm going to be talking about, which are violets. And this is the common blue violet that you will see growing wild. Violets are a pretty large family. Your pansies, your violas, jump up johnnies, they're all in the same family. They just look a little different. They might have um, larger petals. They may come in colors that you're not going to see in nature. I'm afraid that it warmed up enough that the bugs attached or attacked my uh, violets outside. So all I have is this purple one to kind of show you, but this is the family we're looking at right now. So ignore the fact that I've got a little baby pansy right here. Violets are a pretty popular flower too because they go through all of winter. They actually don't start looking bad until we get into late spring, early summer. They're not too keen on that hot weather. They get a little leggy, they start to seed. And even if you cut them back, it's usually best to just kind of let them go to sleep for a while. And if you're lucky and they've seeded properly, they'll start popping back up for you in the fall into winter. But that's what makes them such a great plant is the fact that there isn't a lot you can pull from in January and February, but you can pull your violets and use those. Now, today they tend to solely be used in confectionaries, 
Uh, you will see them taking the violets and candy coating them and putting them on cakes and cupcakes. And they are beautiful. Uh, like a lot of your flowers, I feel like they have a bit of a, a carrot-like flavor to them, so a, a semi-sweetness. You can eat the pansies and the Jump Up Johnnies that you get from uh, your local markets. They're just not going to have the same flavor as those common blue violets that are out in nature. They seem to have a more concentrated sweetness to them. So if you can get your hands on some seeds, or if you know an area that they grow and you can do a, a proper transplant, I would recommend trying those. The simplest thing you could see someone doing if they wanted to ingest um, violets, of course, is to eat them, strew them maybe in a salad, but you also see them drying them and using it in tea form. And violets are really good. They have vitamin A and C. Um, they believe believed that the swelling of your joints. In fact, it was used as a pain reliever throughout its history, especially with those that suffered from arthritis. Um, we see sometimes it listed in Greek medical traditions as an anesthetic, or an anesthetic, sorry. Uh, today, when I look back, I see violets being used more so for arthritis and pains and swellings when I look at records that date from, let's say, the 17 and 1800s. Uh, we, at least I haven't seen too many uses of it being used as an anesthetic, or anesthetic. Sorry, I can't pronounce that word. Because I see other plants being used in place of it at this time. Now, another thing you might see someone doing, and they're gonna have to harvest a lot, is sometimes I've, I've seen records of if you cannot get another type of plant to use for dye, violets could be used. I've not been successful in that attempt, and it could be I've not been able to harvest enough to get a strong enough dye color. So I'm, I'm, I've only seen that in a very loose translation of a journal, so I'm not sure if they were using the violets we think of today, or maybe it was another type of plant that yielded uh, a blue dye. And I'm, I meant to mention this at the beginning, by the way, if you have questions as I'm going along at any point, I will do questions at the end, but feel free to write them up in the chat box. If you're like, I thought of something, I wanna ask it now, I'll forget it at the end. And when I do questions at the end, I can answer any of these questions that you might have. All right, so from violets, I am now gonna go on to American ramps or wild leeks. Ramps in America are different than a European version of wild leeks, which is sometimes known as bear garlic. Uh, the ones here in America have a, and I'm afraid I don't have any with me, but they have a nice, long, thin, tapered leaf. It almost looks like a feather, but in leaf form and the fact that that wonderful shape to it. And then at the bottom, it has a nice little white bulb. It will look very similar bulb-wise to when you get like a, a spring onion. Now, ramps are very popular as an early spring green, not just in the South, but in a lot of areas. And it's also a plant that we see the Native Americans, especially the Cherokee, using historically as an early spring green. In the Appalachian Mountains, it was very welcome to see ramps starting to appear because for the folks that lived in the Appalachian Mountains, it was a sign that winter was done and it was time to move into spring. Um, it was also believed by some folkloric traditions to be a plant that when it came, it would kind of banish any winter ailment you would have. I'm not sure if that meant the aches and pains that might have come with cold weather are, are starting to become a, a little better with the warming trend. Uh, there's a belief throughout history that your darker times of the year, winter, there might be harmful spirits that are out that are causing mischief. That's why a lot of festivals as you go into the spring might not just involve bonfires, but ringing of loud bells, 
um, banging of pots and pans. You're basically not just saying spring is here, but you're trying to vanquish and scare off these spirits that might be causing a problem. So with wild leeks and American ramp, you kind of see the residuals of a much older folkloric tradition. Now with them, you can eat them like you would any type of uh, spring onion or leek itself. It has a very, very pleasant taste. I actually really enjoy them. Again, that is a plant I would recommend you get from a farmer's market or perhaps you grow yourself. Uh, it can look like some other plants out in the wild and they may not be tech toxic, but they may not necessarily be a plant that you would like to um, digest. It could cause some, um, we'll just say digestive issues. The next plant that I'm gonna talk about is nettles. And nettles are kind of like the dandelion I talked about earlier. They have a very, very, very long history and multiple uses when it comes to, to treating your body. Um, you have to be careful with nettles. I don't know if you've all had experience. I sadly, when I was over in England, saw a beautiful meadow and I thought, you know, it's whatever, it's a beautiful metal. I'm gonna take my flip flops off and dance across the blue bills and there were nettles. And I can tell you this right now, it's probably the most pain my feet have ever been in. It felt like a thousand little stings. It took a while to finally go away. And I have to admit, it scared me away from nettles for a while. It wasn't until I started meeting people in the culinary field who were processing nettles for dressings and teas and such like that, that I, I kind of fell in love with nettles and said, okay, this plant is all right. Because of the stinging um, qualities of it, it has to be soaked in water or cooked prior to use. And you need to only harvest the very top of the young nettle. The farther down you go, it's going to become more fibrous and tough and just not a good plant um, to digest. It has its own flavor. It has a lot of vitamins, minerals. Uh, it is extremely good for the system. And once you cook it and preserve it with vinegar or an oil, you had a nice little tonic that you could use throughout the year. Um, it's also a plant that was used for spinning fiber. We tend to today think of just cotton or maybe flax or silk, but there was a wide range of plants that were used throughout history that would have been spun and used to make cloth. If you've ever read the fairy tale by Hans Christian Andersen, The Wild Swans, it's a sister, Her she's a princess, the princes are turned into swans, and to save her brother, she actually has to spin nettles into, we'll call them sweaters, um, that each one of her brothers has to wear to basically break the spell. Now, this poor princess wasn't allowed, though, to properly take care of the nettles prior to using them. She wasn't allowed to soak them in water. She wasn't allowed to cook them. So she has to go through the pain of working with these stinging nettles without making a sound the whole time. And if you've never read that fairy tale, I, I recommend that you give it a go. It's, it, it has this long tradition, and maybe one day I'll talk about this, where swans are, are a huge um, iconic creature when it comes to folklore and fairy tales, especially over in Europe, and you have your swan maidens and such. Think of Swan Lake. But if, again, you're making your nettles at home, do soak them in water and cook them before you have them. There are a wide range of recipes on the internet for nettles. They've become kind of trendy. I'm gonna say the last couple of years, especially in your farm to table communities. One of the ways I like using nettles is to cook it down to a vinaigrette with vinegar. And it's if you can get it to a thick enough consistency, it's especially if you add some olive oil to it, get it almost like a pesto and then drizzle that on fresh made flatbreads, pizzas, uh, especially once it comes out, you can throw on maybe some of those dandelion leaves, 
a little bit of the violets that you're growing. You can have a really, really, really tasty spring pizza or flatbread and using that in place of a, a typical marinara sauce. You do see nettles being used as far back as Egypt and typically this plant was used to help as a pain reliever. As far as Europe itself, I also see it being used like the dandelion kind of as a diuretic to help purge the system. In fact, almost all the plants of spring had multiple uses, but you do see them again and again coming back to being a diuretic or a purger for your system. And if some of you are confused by this, and I'm, I'm not gonna go into it, that's a whole nother top, but keep in mind traditional medicine, treatment was for your four humors, blood, phlegm, black and yellow bile, which had to stay properly balanced in your um, body for you to be healthy. So if one is unhealthy or has an ailment, perhaps we need to do an extraction through bloodletting, puking, purging, blistering, sweating. I think you've all heard of President Washington and his bloodletting towards the end of his career. So if you're a little confused, kind of go down that rabbit hole and that will explain the traditional medicine. Today itself, with modern medicine, a lot of these plants you will see being used, it's just the syn synthetic version of these plants in medicine today. So it's interesting to see that sometimes traditional medicine and, and folkloric, what we call folkloric medicine today and treatments can still have a, a pretty powerful impact. It's just they're not, not necessarily using the plant in nature itself. And the final plant that I will be talking about today is black willow. Black willow is native to America. It has saliatic acid in it. So some of you, in fact, whenever I've talked about plant lore in the past, willow bark being used as aspirin seems to be the one plant everyone's heard about. It's, it's very similar to ginger for a queasy stomach, ginseng, which was good for the whole entire body. It is universally used as a pain reliever. We see not only the early colonists using it early on for tinctures and, and tonics, we also see the Native Americans using this plant pretty heavily in their treatments. Um, it's often a tea, but sometimes you can see it being distilled into a tonic. The nice thing about your black willow is it's not necessarily the leaves that you're after. So you don't have to wait to harvest from that plant later on in the season when it has green leaves. You can harvest from that plant during this time of the year because it's the bark that you're going after. And you want more or less the bark, it seems to be from your younger shoots, but any type steeped in hot water is going to produce some of that acid to help as a pain reliever. Another thing you can see them using as a pain reliever during this time period is rosemary. Uh, rosemary, let me pull from my posy glass, although I'm sure you all know what rosemary looks like, but here we go. I've got my rosemary. Now, down here in North Carolina, you can find your rosemary growing still this time of the year. In fact, some of you may have noticed it's starting to put its pretty little purple, bluish color buds out for spring. Colder climates, it is a Mediterranean plant. It's, it's not gonna do as well, but that's not to say people didn't bring potted plants in indoors or wouldn't shelter potted plants. So if let's say you live somewhere where there is no black uh, willow, you do not live somewhere where there's an apothecary where you could acquire maybe a more exotic pain reliever, you can see them using rosemary. And I wasn't actually gonna go too much into rosemary, but I've decided I'm going to because it is a fascinating plant. And I was gonna save it for the summer, but I've got a bunch of other plants I might talk about in the summertime. I mentioned it could be used as a pain reliever. It actually is also made into a tonic called hungry water, which goes way back in history. Hungry water could be used as a perfume or cologne. It was used as kind of a cure-all tonic. 
especially for what we would consider cold and flu symptoms today. Now, we're all going into spring and some of you might be starting to suffer seasonal allergies like I am. I, I was gonna have a whole bunch of beautiful flowers behind me until I woke up this morning, I couldn't stop itching my eyes. And I decided I, I was gonna have to do away with them. And you're just seeing my baby winter sweet budding back there, which we'll be talking about that bad boy uh, come winter time. But historically, they are aware of seasonal allergies, they don't know really what causes it. They will say it's the pollen in the air and, and such like that. But sometimes you're misdiagnosed as just having a cold or flu when it is just allergies, especially if it is cold or flu-like symptoms, the stuffy nose, sore throat. So by taking hungry water, which is distilled rosemary with other herbs mixed into it, it had different herbs triggering or attacking the different symptoms that you had. So rosemary is going to help with the aches and pains and maybe the cold chills you could be getting. You're going to see in there maybe some lavender. Um, you might have a little bit of feverfew, sage, thyme. These are all plants that you readily had available and you might be growing or you could easily go somewhere and get in their dry powdered form. Another great thing about rosemary is it's used as a fumigant herb. And as I mentioned earlier, it's spring, it's the end of winter, you're purging your body, you're cleaning. You're also going to wanna to clean your home. Uh, if you go back far enough in time in your rural communities, you are not living in these large spacious houses that we do today. Uh, you may not have a separate structure for your livestock to live in. You all might be sharing the same abode through the whole winter time, which means by this time of the year, when you can finally get the livestock out of the house and maybe get away from your fellow family members, you're going to find the house to be a little pungent, to say the least. Not that they weren't clean through winter, but it's kind of like, say, once spring rolls around, what's the first thing we want to do? We want to open our windows and get that winter smell out. And it could be the fact that your house just kind of smells like the uh, marinara sauce you made the night before, which doesn't smell as great 24 hours later as it, it did when you first made it. Fumigants are going to be burnt. Think of like your sage bundles that you might see some folks using for smudging. You're going to burn them and kind of waft it around the house to not only kind of cleanse the air in the sense of the, the scent, but a lot of these plants, certain bugs like lice do not like, and it's going to kind of drive them out and help clean the space. Along with rosemary, thyme was used. You see them also using rue, uh, fennel, chamomile, hemlock in certain areas. So a lot of the plants that have a high concentration of scent in their essential oils are going to be the plants that you're going to see folks using during this time period to kind of cleanse the air. You also will see in certain agrarian societies coming into spring using plants to, I'm not going to say bless the livestock, especially the cows, but it's, it's a tricky time period. Uh, we tend to think today that animals like cows and pigs and chickens, they just live these happy little lives and they never have any kind of ailment or issues except for maybe some health problems once in a while. Um, I have to admit, if, if you've ever had a chance to, and ironically, they just redid the series, All Creatures Great and Small, uh, it's a good series, the new one they did, but go back and watch the one that was filmed in the 80s or read the, the books. It will show you how scary it was for folks historically if one cow or one pig became sick because it could be something that was going to wipe out your whole entire stock, which meant for many people throughout history, they're then going to starve because they're not able to just go and replenish especially if you go prior to germ theory, the study of bacteria, they may not know that a living space, though it may look clean, is still harboring the disease, the bacteria, that if they bring another fresh, healthy animal in, it's just gonna wipe them out. So come spring, 
you're, you're really hoping it's going to be a great year. Nothing's going to happen to them. You're going to use certain plants to kind of cleanse the animal and bless the animal. It could be you might feed it to them if you know it will not harm them. It could be you just simply make posies and hang it in their stalls, or you sometimes see people tying it to the tails. So that is the, the cows are whipping their tails around and such, they're, they're kind of sending out that, that wonderful scent. Carnations, mugwort, marjom um, were used quite heavily to protect livestock. You will also see hawthorn, rowan, birch, and blackthorn being used as protective plants. Now the hawthorn that I'm talking about is not the Indian hawthorn you might have in your gardens here, especially in, in Southport. This is the hawthorn I'm talking about over in Europe, which is a large, beautiful shrub. Um, the most famous one is the one at Glastonbury in England, which it historically blooms around Christmas time and May Day. And especially when it blooms at Christmas time, they would take a branch and they would send it off to their sovereign. So today that would be Queen Elizabeth for them to use in their decor. And this practice actually goes back to James I in England. So plant lore is not just what you might have in growing in your garden, what you might be uh, harvesting. Plant lore goes into trees also that you could have had in your garden or you may have had out and about uh, in a local forest that you could use. And I'm gonna finally end the talk. I'm actually gonna move away from plants for just one second and talk about moon phases or full moons, I should say. So March's moon is known as the worm moon. It's also sometimes called the sap moon or the wind seed moon. But the worm moon's pretty important. Um, I've met people born in March and they're like, oh, I wish my month had a better sounding <laughs> moon. For instance, February is like the snow or the stone moon. And I told him, I said, well, it's actually pretty important because you want those worms, the earthworms, the grubs, because that is a sign that the earth is warming up and spring is around the corner. So today when I moved my pot of very, very sad looking common blue violets, I was happy to note that underneath for the first time in a long time, I saw some earthworms kind of digging further down. So April, which is coming up, is actually known as the egg moon, the pink moon sometimes even called the hawk moon. And then the final moon of the spring season is May. It's known as the flower moon, the hair moon, or the frog's return moon, <laughs> which we may, we may be like, okay, but if the frogs come back, that means that warm weather is here to stay and we're going into summertime. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me for that segment. Um, what I'm going to do next is real quick go over the recipes and the activities that um, are included with spring. And then when I'm done that, I'll see if anybody has any questions. So I'm ready for our first slide. All right, so I mentioned earlier the dandelion coffee. So here's a recipe that I was able to find. And it's, it's a pretty straightforward, easy recipe. Um, if you dig up dandelion roots to do this, unless you're trying to eradicate them from your yard, make sure you don't harvest all of them. And if you have one that looks particularly large and hardy, you may want to leave that one alone because that might be the grandparent plant. And that's going to help produce more dandelions for you to get those beautiful flowers and leaves in the future. You're of course going to cut the root from the rest of the plant, which you can use in various different ways. You're then going to clean it and cut it into about half inch pieces and spread them on a baking sheet. And you don't have to spray the baking sheet, but you might want to put some parchment paper down. You're going to roast them for, at 200 degrees for about one hour. Let them cool. If you don't have a coffee mill or you're a little leery of using your coffee mill to uh, grind these up, you can of course just steep them in the hot water. If you're a little nervous the first time drinking dandelion uh, coffee straight, what you can do is put some of these maybe down in your drip coffee with some regular coffee grounds 
and try it that way and 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 see and if you you don't notice a horrific taste that's throwing you off i recommend then you try it um by itself all right next slide uh oh i'm i'm giving you a heads up right now i can hear sirens and even though he was sleeping two seconds ago my dog tends to howl with sirens so i'm kind of hoping he uh is going to stay quiet he's very alert and he's staring at me so if you hear a howling in the background it is not a werewolf it's it's just my my dog all right so any of the plants that i mentioned you can make an oil out of and in fact you could also do an infusion with honey and it's going to be pretty much the same thing you want to make sure you're filling a clean uh, glass bottle or jar uh, for the oil, you're going to use virgin olive oil for your honey, whatever your preferred honey is. You're going to add into it your fresh herbs. Uh, for instance, your dandelion. Uh, remember, remove the green part at the bottom, the bracken part, but use those pretty little petals up top and you can drop them in. And one of the easiest ways to do an infusion without having to make a mess on your stove is to then just place these jars by your window and just kind of let the sunlight do the job for you. You want to make sure they're clean. Um, oil and honey, especially honey, it's antiseptic, but still there is a chance you could um, have something growing in there if you're not using clean jars and lids. But let it sit for however long you would like for the strength. Once you remove it, you'll be able to use this as dressings. Um, you can use it for cooking. The honey itself, you might add to your tea or coffee or just drizzle on top of bread. All right, next recipe. Syllabubs. All right, I know this might seem kind of strange, me talking about a syllabub, because it doesn't really incorporate any of the plants that I've just talked about, but syllabubs were very popular in the spring, um, especially around May Day. So if you weren't making May Punch, which had sweet wood roof in it, you do see people having syllabub. And it's gonna be one pint of cream, and this is going to be about mid to, to late spring, especially when your cows have calves and they're really producing milk at this point. So one pint of fresh cream, half a pint of wine. And if you've made yourself some dandelion wine, then go ahead and use that. And then the juice and grated peel of one dried lemon, um, sweet into your taste. Now, I said I, I did a little faux pas right here. I've got juice and then dried lemon. In a modern sense, you can go ahead and use a fresh lemon, so do juice it and use the lemon peel. Historically though, this time of the year, you're probably gonna be relying on your citrus that you dried over the winter time. And we'll discuss that at a, a later topic, but you're just gonna grate that dried lemon and that will give you that nice citrus flavor. You're gonna put this all in a bowl and you're gonna whisk it until you have soft peaks. You can then do two things. You can either pour it into the glasses and then set it in the refrigerator overnight and it's gonna slowly separate. You can eat it right then and there, or you can just let it sit out at room temp to separate. And you can use a straw to eat this, you can use a spoon to go through the top layer and then sip the bottom, but this is a, a recipe that you see in multiple cookbooks. I pulled it from the Carolina Housewife. Um, this is a recipe I actually like to make up every Christmas, and it is delightful. If you have folks that do not drink, you can always use a sparkling cider or a non-alcoholic um, beverage of your choice that you would like to try this with, maybe like a grape juice. All right, next slide. And the activity, oh, and the activity for this talk is basically turning the things around your home into greenhouses. Um, some of us may not, me included, have the luxury of having a large glass greenhouse outside or even maybe a garage, but you might wanna start sowing seeds this time of the year. So 
What you can do is look around your house and see what you have on hand and turning those objects into little mini greenhouses. So the first one is an old dresser drawer. Uh, for this one, you're gonna wanna drill a couple holes into the bottom for drainage. You're gonna add your small gravel drainage rock and just a two inch la layer, but of course it depends on how deep the drawer is itself. Uh, then you're gonna put potting soil on top, plant your seeds, and then you can cover it with whatever type of plastic sheeting you can get your hands on. And you wanna make sure it's covering it so that no cool breezes can get into the tender little uh, plants themselves. So you could use plastic wrap if you want. Um, and it has to be clear too. You can use maybe a clear plastic shower curtain liner that you're no longer using. Uh, go to your hardware stores, um, see what they have. You might even be able, if your drawers drape enough and you'll have enough space for those shoots to come up, you might even be able to get some, a plastic piece that you just set on top. And on warmer days, if you feel like it's getting too much heat, you can just kind of lift it up or you can vent it. Next slide. You can take glass jars and turn them into greenhouses. So um, one of the easiest things you can actually do, if you wanna line your windowsill with some plants to start growing them from once you get at the grocery store, just take an old glass jar, maybe like your Yo Play yogurt jars, and you can actually just fill that up with water and put, let's say, the bulb of a spring onion down in there, and that will start rooting itself. Or you can keep those little glass jars or any bigger glass jar, let's say like an old fishbowl, and you can, again, fill it with soil and put your seeds down in it and then put a lid on top. If you're doing something larger, like that fishbowl, um, I do recommend that you put some form of a uh, drainage rock down at the bottom. That way that soil itself does not become compacted and, and too wet and heavy for the plants itself. Next, I think there was one more slide. Yes. All right, and this is my favorite because for some reason I, I tend to go through grills. Uh, taking an old grill, and turning it into a greenhouse, especially if you have a, a double-sided grill, maybe one side was charcoal, the other was gra or, um, gas, and it's just gotten to the point where you no longer want to use it or you're getting a new one, you could actually use one as a potting bench and then the other as your greenhouse. But again, you're going to want to drill some holes in the bottom if you're going to put the soil into the grill itself. You're then going to put drainage, your soil, put your plants in, and then make sure you have some type of a plastic lid, which is gonna let the sunlight in, but trap the heat in for those plants to grow. If you have a deep enough grill, you can then find some small potting pots and put those down in, and then you don't have to worry about drilling too many holes. I would just make sure if it, water gets into that and seeps out from the pots, it has somewhere to escape and you don't have water that's just kind of sitting in the bottom of your grill. Now for planting, you're gonna look for different plants. Oh, no, it's okay, you can go to the next one. <laughs> so those are just a few ideas. Um, and if you look online, there are just, it's endless. I, I love it. Liz and I were talking earlier, she found the one where it's the umbrella that they used on top of one of their pots to act as um, the plastic wrap to trap in those uh, that nice heat and sun. Uh, if you're looking at a farmer's almanac this time of the year, they are telling you certain plants to look for and one to plant because you didn't have the modern technology we have today to look things up. So crocuses were usually assigned to start planting your radishes, parsnips, and spinach. When you saw the forsythia in bloom, it was safe to start planting peas, onions, and lettuce. And then half-hardy vegetables could be planted when dan or daffodils were starting to come up, such as beets, carrots, shards. And then dandelions. Most people, when they saw dandelions popping up, it was time to get ready for potatoes. Uh, if your maple tree is starting to bloom, then perennial flowers were put out. Apple trees, you would see them planting bush beans. So 
if you want to get into seasonal gardening and you want to try your hand at maybe the more traditional aspect, I would recommend getting the Farmer's Almanac um, and just looking through it and just kind of basing your year out with it. Not only do you kind of feel like you're getting in touch with how folks may have done things in the past, but it's, it's just kind of a fun experiment to see how it goes. And the Farmer's Almanac is, is pretty accurate. At least that's been my experience. Well, I want to thank you all for joining me. And if anybody has any questions, I am here to answer them, hopefully. So, Desi, I have a few questions. I don't want to cut in front of if anybody else. I, I sent you one in chat. Are sand spurs a type of nettle? When you were talking about nettles, are those in that family or? Not that I'm I'm aware of. Okay. Um, I'm not saying they're not in the, the very broad sense, but the nettles I'm talking about, and I wish I had some, are um, a very fleshy, very green, very uh. verdant looking plant. And then the nettles themselves are like these nasty little hairs that <laughs> um, come off of them themselves. And when cooked down, it's a, a very beautiful, bright, I'm not going to say a sage green. It's a little darker than that, but it's not quite as dark as a pesto when that one uh, goes down. Okay. I was trying to find some saving grace in Sandsburg. So, um, <laughs> so I noticed that um, every, a lot of the things you were talking about were all um, like foraging, where you would go and, and look for these things growing mm -hmm. wild practically. Is that because it was the spring and people wouldn't have had time to plant garden? So they were looking for, for things that were growing naturally? It, it mainly is because I won't, I'll have so much source material the next three seasons. I won't be doing too much in the foraging realm um, because you would have been very busy with your garden. Now, the um, if you go over to Europe, the dandelions would have been a potted plant or in a garden. So you would have been tending it this time of the year. The same with the violets. Um, the fiddlehead ferns. So in a sense in America, because they naturalized and kind of took off, we would think of it more as a foraging plant. That's not to say folks weren't trying to cultivate it in their gardens per se, but it was, I kind of wanted to do more of a foraging aspect with this talk. And then the next three talks are going to be predominantly what you would have been growing in your garden or what you might have if you were able to ship in from another area for instance citrus and such like that that was considered a seasonal plant whether it was something you had in your back garden or not and would one last question would most of the people in southport um, mm -hmm. in the 1800s or about the time, would they, have, would they have had this knowledge? Was this common knowledge that most of the housewives would have known to go and gather these things or how to make um, these teas to help with medicine and things? Yes and no. Um, it's so hard to, to say yes, definitely, because I hate generalizing history because too often we, we tend to take time periods and group people and think they're all of the same mindset. We think they all were great farmers. Um, everyone could spin, everyone could do this. So I am sure you had those in this area that, especially if you go far enough back, if you go to your early 1800s and such, this is a knowledge that was just culturally available. So even if in your family itself, they may not be utilizing some of these practices, it was something they've either heard of or they knew of. Um, it's very similar to today. We might be aware of something folks do in another region of America, but it just may not be practical or, or just part of the cultural group in the area that we live in today. Um, your early colonists, dandelion definitely is something they were going to be bringing over. Um, your American ramps, your nettles, other plants, these are plants that are very similar to the European counterparts. 
So if they didn't look at that and recognize it and say, well, it may not be the same as what we have in Europe, but it's in the same family, I'm going to use it as such. It could be with their dealings when they came across the Native Americans. And it was one of the beneficial times that there was an ebb and flow of conversation. They're going to be like, oh, well, you use this for this? Well, fascinating. Does it work? Well, maybe we can try it. Um, but yes, definitely. I, I didn't really talk about anything. And that's the other thing. I tried to stay with items that were relatively commonplace during the time period. So they may be very um, odd or unique by our standards today, but you go back to a certain time period and further back through the history, and these are all plants people were very familiar with, just as familiar as we might be some of the more exotic species that we have in our gardens today. For instance, Japanese maples. Um, you look at them and you say, oh, they're beautiful, but we tend not to think of a Japanese maple as an exotic plant um, because they've just kind of taken off an American garden. Uh, did, did that answer your question? Okay, mm -hmm. good. I, I tend to kind of go all over. <laughs> all right, any other questions? Well, real quick, if I don't have any more questions before we go, um, at the end of my four-part talk, I'll give, I'll have a full bibliography. But with each one, I am going to mention three books that if you would like to try some stuff at home or go further down the rabbit hole of plant lore, these are the first three that I would recommend. One is American Household Botany. Uh, by Judith Sumner. This is a great book. No, I did not steal it from a library. I, I did buy this um, used. <laughs> uh, I've had people kind of ask about this, but uh, this is a wonderful book that just kind of takes you through uh, not just agrarian, but even what you might have seen in the urban centers, maybe in the apothecaries, people would have been using traditionally. And it's a wide range of, of plants. It's not just the ones we would have in the garden. I have The Herbal Cures, America's First Book of Botany and Healing. This is something pretty much almost every historical site relies on. You can get this used online too. It's fascinating because it has basically the old recipes in here from various other sources. So that's good if you wanna try some of these at home. And then the final is a recent find of mine I'm a huge Tolkien fan, I will say that now. Harry Potter will be working its way into this lecture series too, by the way. But this is um, Flora of Middle Earth, and it talks about the plants that are used throughout the whole Tolkien series. It is by a gentleman who is a biologist in the University of Florida, Walter Judd. So it, it, it is a legit, botany book. It's just, he talks about plants in our sense and then how they were used by Tolkien because Tolkien had an extensive knowledge of plant lore because it's, it's just a fascinating subject. All right. Hey Desi, I'd like to, I'd like to thank you. And I think it is <laughs> kind, of, uh, kind of unique, but, but there was one especially unique feature of, to, of your presentation today. That was, we've done about 60 virtual programs over the last year, and yeah. this was our first werewolf alert. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's, he's actually pouting because he came, and he was sitting right where you couldn't see him staring at me, because I will admit we howl together, because it's, it's one, I just love my dog too much. But he is now on the other side of the couch with his back to me, and he won't even acknowledge me because <laughs> the siren <laughs> went. And he doesn't understand me talking to a computer, so he thinks I'm just like ignoring him and talking to myself, I guess. So, <laughs> but no, it's uh, it's known with my neighbors around here that I have a, a werewolf living with me. He's an interesting <laughs> dog. <laughs> so, Desi, we did get a request to. Um, to send out your slides. And I, mm -hmm. I tried while you were talking to be clever and it 
send them out in the chat, but it didn't work. So um, what I will do is, if it's okay with you, I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's okay with you if we send them out, I can um, attach them. The next time I send out a um, communication to everybody for our upcoming program, I think we have second Tuesday talk next week, I will, um, I'll attach the uh, a, a link to the slides. So okay. if you guys are looking for that, um, look in the next email that you get from uh, Southport Historical Society, okay? So, um, this was great. I could, I could sit and listen to you forever. It's so much great. fun, Desi, so much fun. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm just glad people like to listen about this subject. <laughs> Very informative. Okay, so Desi will be back in three months, right? Yes. Whatever, I can't, whatever that month is, I can't pick out of April, May, June. June. <laughs> so that's the first Tuesday of June. So um, be sure and, and look for that. And just as a reminder, we will be having a program on the first Tuesday of April, which will be a, a Living Voices program. We're doing that quarterly as well. Um, and that will be Travis Gilbert, uh, another board member. And he's now the executive director of the Historic Wilmington Foundation, I believe. And, but uh, formerly of Old Baldy. So he is going to be doing um, Sonny Dosher from, uh, <laughs> from Baldhead. So um, keep that in mind on the first, of, uh, first Tuesday of April. Okay. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, Desi. Oh, no, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> fabulous. Thank you. Excellent. I look forward to you guys in June. <laughs>